joy of uh, um, uh, being here uh, with you today in chapel. Um, uh, you guys are richly blessed to be here, uh, to be here for uh, chapel services uh, like you are uh, today. Uh, you guys are well served, well fed uh, from the pulpit here, and uh, I wish I had the kind of blessing uh, that you guys have uh, during your college years uh, to be so well served uh, during uh, this time. It's really a, a privilege. Uh, we had chapel uh, twice a week at the Master's Seminary. I graduated uh, back in 2010, uh, and I understand the joy of coming to chapel uh, multiple times during the week, but I also understand that it's a sacrifice as well. Uh, because there's the, the projects, the papers, the quizzes, uh, the tests that you have to prepare for during your time here. Uh, but I want to reassure you uh, that the message from today will be on the exam. This will be on the test. I can't, I can't tell you when that test is going to happen for you uh, or what it will look like for you, but I can assure you that the questions that we'll talk about today will be on your test because the kind of test that we're talking about today is a test that we face as believers. And the question that's going to be on your test is who will you worship? Who will you worship? And that's really the question that's underneath every temptation. The question of, of worship. And that's the question that was underneath the temptation that Jesus faced in Matthew chapter 4 when Satan finally pulls the mask off. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 9, he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. It was a question about who will you worship? Who will you worship? The Antichrist desires worship. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. It says he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God and object of worship so that he himself takes the seat in the temple displaying himself as being God. It's about worship. And what's beneath the temptations that we face in our day is who will we serve and who will we worship? And that's exactly what we find in our text for today in Daniel chapter 3. So if you would, take your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 3. And I'm going to grab a microphone stand over here so I don't have to hold this the whole time. Can you hear me still? <laughs> All right. Turn in your Bibles to Daniel uh, chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. This is the, uh, the story of one of the most well-loved narratives in the, the scriptures of the entire Bible, the fiery furnace. Uh, the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is uh, legendary. I mean, we're all familiar with the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, you don't need to be long in Sunday school before uh, you hear about this story. You're introduced to the story of the fiery furnace. And if you're fortunate enough, it was also accompanied by a flannel graph as you were growing up. Some of you know what a flannel graph is. For the, for the rest of you, you can Google that when I'm, when I'm done here. Uh, but the courage of these young men is legendary. And they're enshrined in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, where their faith is said to quench the power of fire. But the greatest lesson in Daniel chapter 3 is not what their faith did, but who their faith was directed to. It's really a question about who they worshiped. And if you pay attention to the details of the narrative, that's exactly the point that we're drawn to. If you look down at uh, Daniel chapter 3 and verse uh, 28, look at what it says here. It says, Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So again, it's not about them, it's about their God. Who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies. Why? So as not to serve or worship any God except their own. Again, it's the question about worship. And I understand that the theme of uh, this year's uh, chapels are strengthening and defending your faith. And I want to submit to you that you won't be prepared to defend the faith unless you understand the value of it. And making a defense of the, the faith according to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse uh, 15 is connected to sanctifying Christ as Lord in your hearts. It's about honoring him, about valuing him. And the question that you should be asking yourself as we walk through Daniel chapter 3 is, who is it that's worthy of my worship? This is a, a worship war, and you're in it whether you realize that or not. You're making decisions about who you're going to give your ultimate allegiance to, even if that ultimate allegiance is directed to a golden statue of yourself. Somebody is going to take the number one spot and you will defend whoever is in that spot. 
Let's take a look at Daniel chapter 3, and I'll start at verse 1. Daniel chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Since so Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits, he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Let's uh, bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, come before you, Lord, and my uh, Father, we ask that uh, you, Lord, would speak to us during this time. My uh, Father, that you would open up your word to us, help us to apply these things to our lives. Now, help us to ask the questions that are raised from this text and help us to apply your word to our hearts. And I pray that you would use me as a weak instrument to be a blessing to your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In these first three verses of Daniel chapter 3, we find the desire for worship. Even though it's not made explicit at first, the desire for worship is beneath this request of gathering all these men together to the dedication of Nebuchadnezzar's image. If you remember back in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Do you remember that? In Daniel chapter 2, he had a dream about uh, the statue and really the kingdoms of the earth were pictured as the statue. And then the kingdom of Christ, which was uh, pictured as a stone that was cut out of a mountain, came and crushed the kingdoms of the earth. And in that dream, the statue had a head of gold, and that head of gold represented Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom. And here you have Nebuchadnezzar being told in chapter 2, in no uncertain terms, that your kingdom will not last. Your kingdom's not going to last. The kingdoms of the earth must give way to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. But what does Nebuchadnezzar do next? Rather than accepting his defeat, moving out of the way, he attempts to defy the word of God by setting up the statue, uh, really representing a kingdom in opposition to God. This statue is really about Nebuchadnezzar's competing kingdom. He saw a statue uh, that represented the kingdoms of men, and what does he set up? A statue representing the kingdoms of men. And the word for image in chapter 3 that's used of this image that he set up is the same word that was used for the statue back in chapter 2. So there's a clear connection between chapter 2 and chapter 3. There's also a connection between himself and this image that he sets up. Back in chapter 2, the uh, image in his dream was a head of gold, and now he makes the entire statue of gold. That's not an accident. In verse 15, he says, uh, he doesn't say, what God is there that can deliver you from my God's hands? But in verse 15, he says, what God is there who can deliver you from my hands? Where, where is he putting himself on the level with? He's putting himself on the level with God. And over and over again in this chapter, the statue is referred to as, the, as the, the statue that he set up. He sets it up. And commentator Leon Wood writes, kings often symbolized themselves in figures. And I believe that Nebuchadnezzar is really the focus of this statue as a way to, to kind of sneak in worship of himself. It was not uncommon for uh, pagan kings to be deified, to be looked at as, as gods. Darius deified himself in chapter 6. Uh, there was a king uh, who uh, Daniel prophesied about later who would uh, deify himself and speak out against the Most High. We find that Herod deified himself in Acts chapter 12. And Nebuchadnezzar here clearly has a desire to be honored as more than just a king. He thought of himself, he thought of himself as bigger than life. And that's what's depicted in this statue. Look at verse 1 again. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. A cubit is about 18 inches in length, and uh, 60 cubits is 90 feet tall. So just imagine uh, nine basketball hoops stacked one on top of the other. And the base of the statue would have been nine feet in diameter, about the size of a small car. And it was completely covered in gold, probably constructed of wood, and then overlaid with gold. And he sets this up in the plain of, of Dura. Uh, this wasn't in the city of Babylon, where it would have to compete uh, with the other idols. This was set apart. And there's actually a, a site that was excavated 12 miles south of the ancient city of Babylon uh, called the Mounds of Dura. And a, a rectangular brick structure uh, was found in this place, 45 feet square, 20 feet tall. And it was said by the excavators that this could have likely been a pedestal for this kind of image. Nebuchadnezzar raises this image up and he halts all government activity to observe the spectacle. Look at verse 2. It says, then 
Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. This is the political who's who's list of Babylon. You know, the, the satraps, the prefects, all these government officials all gathered together. All of the government is shut down. For what? For the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. That's it. Underneath this desire to dedicate the image to himself is, is really this desire for worship. Because he's essentially challenging God here. God, you're not going to tear my kingdom down. He's challenging God. And it's no accident that this statue was set up on the same ancient site of Babel, where mankind once rebelled against God. It's the, really the first temptation that you can be like God. Nebuchadnezzar's desire to be like God now turns into a demand. Look at verse 4. It says, Then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. So the desire turns into the demand. And this is what desires unrestrained looks like. If you want to know what unrestrained desires look like, it's right here. We are little gods in the making. Uh, John Calvin says that our hearts are idol factories. We don't want to respect the boundary between the creator and the creature. And we're constantly applying for his job. We don't want to worship the one who's on the throne. We want to be on the throne. And Nebuchadnezzar just happened to have the political power to, to pull this off. And here Nebuchadnezzar demands universal worship. This is like his own great commission. You know, all peoples, nations, men of every language, everybody's to hear this. All the nations that surrounded Babylon, come and worship the king. He even has his own worship team. Not as good as what we had here today, but he had his own worship team in verse 5. At the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up wind instruments, stringed instruments. There's what's called a bagpipe, uh, which uh, is one of the most disputed of the, of the group, but uh, another kind of instrument that was used. It's actually translated as a word for, for symphony in the, the Greek translation of this. But here we have the, the music, and what's important about this is that it's the signal to fall down in worship. And whoever does not worship will be thrown into the fire. Look at verse 6. But whoever does not fall down in worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Uh, this, this furnace would have been a large oven. Uh, we call it a kiln today, K-I-L-N. It was used for baking bricks, for melting metal. And uh, there would have been two openings, one on the top where you would put the material in and an opening on the bottom where you would pull the material out. And this was a construction-sized oven. And we know this because it was large enough for four men to walk around in. And here it is, right there on site. One author says that uh, it may have been the furnace used to make the metal used for the giant image. So it had to be in close proximity to the statue because they had to pour this gold on top of the statue. So, so here's the scene. Think about the scene. You've got the who's who's list, everybody that's important in the, the, the ro with their royal attire on. You've got the statue that's looming over you 90 feet. Behind the statue is a construction-sized furnace. And then you have the king's spokesman crying out, whoever does not fall in worship is immediately going to be cast into the fire. And it's right there. The oven's right there. Maybe it's still even warm. And the question is, at this point, what are you going to do? I'll tell you this much. If you wait until the moment when the music plays to make up your mind, you've waited too late. You've waited too late. This is a decision that needs to be made ahead of time. You don't wait until the band starts to determine what your convictions are. You can't wait until you're sitting in a boardroom or you're called into someone's office or you're invited to someone's wedding or you're on the other end of a Zoom call to make up your mind about what you believe. You don't have a, a year to do a word study on what is an image. You know, who, who really knows what an image is? Maybe we need to do, you know, get a committee together and figure out what an image is. You know, what is worship really? Can we, can we get some people together to decide what worship really is so I can decide if this is right or wrong? You know, what is a woman? What is a man? It's, it's too late. 
If you're trying to make up your mind when the test comes, it's too late to prepare yourself. There's nothing to think about. You know why? Because you should know who you worship. You should know who you worship. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. That has to be a conviction that's baked in. I know who I worship. And that's a conviction that's worth dying for and worth losing your job for and worth being rejected for, worth being persecuted for. Because the, the worship of God means more to us than our life does. We'd rather die with him than to live without him. That's the kind of conviction that we need to have. And whatever promotion I get from bowing the knee to Nebuchadnezzar is not worth it. And these young men understood that the kingdom they saw was not the only kingdom that there was. This is not it. These young men would have understood that Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. They knew what Job said, that even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. This is not it. They were familiar with Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but you, and besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail. I might die, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. They knew about the, the kingdom that Daniel spoke about. Actually, in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 13, Daniel says, it says, But as for you, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. Daniel understood that there's coming a future glory. This life is not all that there is. I'm living for something more than just what I can see. And the God who can grant us the eternal kingdom is a God worth worshiping. And the kingdoms of men can't deliver on their promises. But even among the exiles of Judah, there were many who made the sorrowful exchange and tried to, to gain the world and lost their souls. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 7, look at verse 7. It says, therefore at that time when all the peoples, listen to that, all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipes, all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations and men of every language fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Do you know who all the peoples included? It included people from Judah. People who were raised with the truth. Raised with the scriptures. People who knew the scriptures. But at the time that the music played, they weren't prepared to stand up for their convictions. Rather, they hit the deck. They hit the floor, face down. Even though they knew that the scriptures commanded them against it. Why did these three young men stand out? Because there were many of their peers who fell down. Many of their peers. And I pray to God that you would be those that would stand up at a time when many of your peers are falling down. That you would be the people of conviction. That God would bake these kinds of convictions into your own souls. You have the defense of false worship, verse 8. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews... Uh, literally, the, the word for bringing charges is to eat the pieces of. They're gnawing at them. The Chaldeans were people from southern Babylon and known for their astrology. They were counselors to the king. And some of these same Chaldeans were used as the wise men for Nebuchadnezzar back in chapter 2, who were actually saved by Daniel and his friends. Because if you remember, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to put all of them to death. So here they are. They've been saved by these guys because Daniel and his friends prayed to receive the understanding of the, the vision. But now these same Chaldeans are turning around to bring up charges against those men who actually prayed for their deliverance. But jealousy makes you do strange things, doesn't it? Don't be surprised. This one's going to be on your exam, okay? These Chaldeans were jealous that these Hebrews were appointed as, as administrators over the province of Babylon. They leapfrogged over people who were locals. And now motivated by jealousy, they want to make sure the king doesn't miss that these are the guys that refuse to bow, king. Look at verse 9. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You always got to butter up the king. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, all kinds of music, is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews... And here you see their disdain for the Jewish people here, whom you have appointed, and I can't believe that you've done that. That should be our position over the administration of the province of Babylon. Here's the jealousy. Namely, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. That's not true. 
They haven't disregarded the king. But this next part is true. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. There's this defense of the false worship. Then we find the derangement of false worship. Look at verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and anger gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I've set up? I can't believe anybody would defy my orders. Verse 15, now if you are ready, doesn't even give them an, an opportunity to respond. Now if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, there, there's, there's the, the question, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire, and what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Now at this point you would have hoped that standing in front of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have jogged his memory, <laughs> that these are the, the same guys that I've appointed. Their friend Daniel interpreted my dream. Somebody was walking around and knew the thoughts in my head. Like, you don't mess with a God like that. But here it is. He's already gone. Proverbs 14, 29, he who is quick-tempered exalts folly. He's a fool. Anger makes fools out of people. And listen to how deranged he sounds. What God is there that can deliver you from my hand? He's putting himself on the level of God. And the threat of death is the only tool left in his tool belt. But death is only a useful threat if death is your greatest fear. But these men had a, a fear that was greater than death. They had a fear of God. And here we have the position of true worship. Look at verse 16. And I love this. Love this stance, don't we? What is the response? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. We, we, we've already made up our mind, king. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. There's no decision to be made. There's no need to talk about it. There's no need to debate. There's no need to deliberate. And they're not being disrespectful. They're just stating facts. And they state this without any additional word from the Lord regarding their safety. They have no idea how this is going to end. They're not uncertain about God's deliverance. The only uncertainty is how is this going to play out? Reminds me of the Apostle Paul who spoke about his deliverance in uh, Philippians chapter 1, but he says that that deliverance could come by life or by death. I don't know which way it's going to come. Deliverance does not always mean that we walk out of the furnace. Deliverance sometimes means that we're consumed by the furnace. And you have to have that kind of conviction that even if I am consumed by this trial, that I'm not going to turn against my God. That's the response of true worship. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And sometimes trusting him means paying the ultimate price for worship. Verse 19, you have the price for true worship. And Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath. His facial expression was altered toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, apparently he was composed while he was given to threats, but... Now that he knows they're not going to bend to his threats, his face changes, his expression changes, starts making faces at him. I can't believe this. You know, it's throwing a tantrum. And he gives orders for this, the furnace to be heated seven times more than, than usual. One author speaks about how the production of metals and, and bronze would have required a conduction of some type of furnace to achieve the temperatures necessary to smelt the ore. And uh, these kilns could reach Degrees as high as 1,000 degrees centigrade. That's, that's hot. <laughs> I, I used to do uh, HVAC work before I became a pastor, and I uh, did mostly commercial work. And uh, there was one time I was uh, trying to take a measurement uh, for uh, uh, some, some duct work uh, above steam pipes. And I remember just kind of brushing my, my arm just slightly against the, the steam pipe. I didn't lean on it, just, just slightly brushed it, and my skin immediately melted, just like shriveled up and like peeled off. That was just touching it, just brushing up against it. I still have the scar till this day. I was told that uh, those pipes were only about 500 degrees Fahrenheit, 260 degrees Celsius. We're talking about temperatures as high as 1,000 degrees centigrade. I mean, this, this is, this is a, an inferno here. And whatever fuel they normally use for the work, he says, give seven times more than that. Verse 20, he commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. 
so they can't physically get away. Then these men were tied up in trousers, their coats, their caps, their other clothes were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, so their clothes added fuel. Verse 22, for this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the, fire, the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we have some idea of how hot this fire was. But these three men, verse 23, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire still tied up. And if you never read the end of the story, if the story ended right here, this still would have been a good ending. This still would have been a good ending. Because it still would have been a remarkable story about faith that perseveres under trial. And, and the outcome of our faith, that's in God's hands. We have no idea what the outcome of our faith will be. We can't determine the results. And that's what's so just one of the, the, the tragic lies of word of faith theology. Because they, they teach that faith is only victorious when you live. But faith is victorious even if you die. Even if you die, faith is victorious. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even if they died in the fire, they still would have belonged in Hebrews chapter 11 in the hall of faith. And here we have the prize of true worship. Look at verse 24. The Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astounded, stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. What, what Nebuchadnezzar was expecting to see was, was three charred corpses falling down to the bottom of this furnace. But instead, instead he sees four men and they're all on the loose. And the only items that burn in the, the fire were the ropes that bound them and the men that seized them. Those are the only things that burned. And here they are walking around in the fire. Now, you would think that, that if you were loosed from your bonds and you were able to walk around that you might walk out of the fire. <laughs> But here they, they, they walk around in the fire, in the furnace. Why did they stay in the furnace? The, the company on the inside of the furnace was a lot better than the company on the outside. <laughs> and Nebuchadnezzar is struggling to put words to what he's seeing. He's obviously in shock. He stands up, verse 24, stood up in haste. And the best language that Nebuchadnezzar can come up with is, is the appearance of this fourth one is like a son of the gods. You know, apparently the, the brilliance of this fourth man was brighter than the fire around him. And the question is, who is this fourth man? And I don't want to take a, a long time to get into this, but sometimes in Scripture, an angel is more than just an angel. There are times when an angel is actually considered to be God himself. In Genesis 18, you have uh, three men who visited Abraham. Two of them were angels who went into Sodom. But then it says that Abraham stood before the third one, and it says that he was standing before the Lord. You have other passages, Exodus chapter 3, where an angel speaks out of the burning bush. And this angel who speaks out of the burning bush says, Moses, Moses, he says, here I am. Take the shoes off your feet because the ground that you're standing on is holy. Who was speaking from this bush? It says the Lord saw that he turned aside. And God called to him from the midst of the bush. Here you have an angel who's more than an angel. And this could be one example in scripture of a time when an angel is more than just an angel. It could be that this is the second person of the Trinity, the one who explains the Father to us, who made the invisible God visible. And the earliest commentaries on Daniel thought so as well. One of the church fathers said how Nebuchadnezzar recognized him and saw here a prefiguration of Christ as Son of God by the Gentiles. <laughs> we can't be certain of this, but this is at least a reminder to us that Jesus promises to be with us, right? Matthew 28, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. One commentator says, whenever his children are in, are in the fiery furnace of trials, for his name's sake, he is there. Christ never sends forth his sheep unless he goes before them. So what is the prize of worship? The prize of true worship is God himself. Whom have I in heaven but you, and besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God is the prize of my worship. And I believe it was the Lord himself who shows up in the furnace of affliction. That's the prize of worship. He's your prize, he is your portion. And finally, what's the proclamation of true worship? Look at verse 26. And this would have been true whether they came out of the fire or not. This would have been a true pro proclamation of, of worship. What's the proclamation? There is no God like this. Because this is the God they're willing to give up their, their lives for. Look again in verse 
26, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. You know, not too close for obvious reasons. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the what? The most high God. Remember before he says, what God is there that could deliver you from my hands? He's about to find out right here. Who can deliver? The most high God can deliver. He's forced to give praise to the most high God. What, what kind of God would, uh, would uh, uh, cause a person to, to give up all of their privileges? What kind of God would cause a person to stand in the midst of adversity? When everybody else is hitting the floor, what kind of God would make you rise up and say, I'm standing with my Savior, the most high God? Because you understand who you worship. Nebuchadnezzar was forced to understand it's the most high God. The Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. And not only Nebuchadnezzar, but all the officials had a front row seat to watch this one. Look at verse 27. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. As one author points out, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not only safe from the, the fire, they're also safe from being suffocated, carbon monoxide poisoning, or possibly other toxic fumes generated in the combustion. This further heightens the magnitude of this spectacular miracle. And all of these high officials who were originally there to gather around this image that Nebuchadnezzar set up, now they're all gathered around Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego beholding the miracle. God has a way of turning things around, doesn't he? Not a hair was singed, not a piece of clothing was damaged. They didn't even smell like smoke. God quenched the power of the fire. And what an embarrassment for Nebuchadnezzar. And these men who delivered Nebuchadnezzar, these men. And now rather than ridiculing the God of the Hebrews, they're forced to give him praise. Look at verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels, delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command and yielded up their body so as not to serve or worship. There it is again. It's about worship. Not to serve or worship any God except their own. Before he punished them for civil disobedience, and now he praises them for it. <laughs> then he defends the honor of this God with this decree, verse 29. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and limb their houses reduced to a rubbish heap, Inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. There's no other God like this God. And then he honors God's servants in verse 30. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. Not only are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego back in their positions, they've been given this additional honor by the king. And there's this nationwide decree with their names on it. Nationwide decree honoring the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, nationwide is on your side. Here we go. <laughs> and if the Chaldeans were upset before, they have to be besides themselves now. That these men have been elevated. Here we, we, we're seeking to bring them down, and now they're higher than they were before. And guess what? They didn't have to compromise to accomplish it. You don't have to compromise. Trust in the Lord. Leave your, your life in the, the hands of the Lord. Let him decide when he pushes you up. Let him make that decision. And there's so much that we could take out of this text. I'll just give you a couple, couple points and then we'll be done. Number one, what we've already mentioned before, who is worthy of your worship? Who's worthy of your worship? This, this is a worship war. What you're, what you're engaged in, even when you're doing apologetics, is really a, a worship war. It's about who will you worship? Who is it going, going to be on the pedestal? Is it going to be yourself on the pedestal? Somebody else that you've placed on the pedestal? The message of Daniel is that there's no other God who's worthy of your worship besides the true God. Number two, what other God is able to deliver in this way? We, we wouldn't have witnessed this great deliverance of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego if they compromised. Do you understand that? We, we wouldn't know about the story if they, they had compromised. And what kind of deliverances are we missing out on because we fall to the temptation? Who knows how God would deliver you? There is no God who can deliver like your God. Trust in him. Number three, does your apologetic include worship? Does it include worship? You don't defend somebody that you don't value. Again, we're setting apart Christ in our hearts as Lord. He is the Lord of my life. 
I'm setting him apart as unique. I value him above all else. I worship him. Your apologetic has to include worship. And number four, do you recognize that God joins you in what he calls you to go through? Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed. For I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, so much for this time that we spent in your word. My Father, I pray that you would use this word to strengthen us, strengthen us, build conviction in us. Father, I pray that we would not fall to the temptations that are all around us. We are in a war, whether we realize it or not. Help us to stand firm uh, because we understand who we worship. And there is no other God who is worthy of it. In Jesus' name we praise you and give you thanks. Amen.